Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Life's Legends, a podcast where we talk about the stories that have shaped and guided us through life. This month, I am joined by Kate, my get my guest here, and we will be talking about Avatar: The Last Airbender, the Nickelodeon cartoon. If you haven't seen that that show, what on earth are you doing? I don't know. I don't know where you where you have been if yeah. you haven't seen or Go. heard about. <laughs> Go right now. Go watch the show, all of it, and then come back. Right. Uh, but there will be spoilers for that show I littered throughout this video mm -hmm. so it's not safe it's not safe go watch maybe the best show ever created and then come back yeah um so kate as you may know or may not know <laughs> i'm not sure if you're one of the seven viewers but um on this podcast i like to go through do a little bit of an intro to who you are um, and then how you kind of engage with stories and stuff like that, just for people listening to, to get to know a little bit about your preferences. So because there's so much to talk about today, I'm going to try and not comment on your answers. No okay. promises. All right. But I'm going to try. So <laughs> we've already gone over your name. Your yes. name is Kate. Kate. How old are you? I am 23 years old. Lovely. Thanks. Already <laughs> failed, by the way. I already commented. Um, <laughs> what's your favorite animal? Uh, my favorite animal is a koala. I, I want to ask more questions. It's okay. You can <laughs> ask. I feel like you're allowed to ask I, No, we got a rapid fire. All we right, got to go. We right, got stuff to talk about. Right. <laughs> um, what is your occupation? My occupation, I'm currently uh, in school to be a table game stealer at a casino. So that is my current occupation. This is also very interesting, but I could talk to you about it another time. <laughs> um, uh, that is cool, though. Yeah. Uh, and what, what is your dream for the future? Um, so I wouldn't say I have a set specific dream for the future. Mostly, uh, I just would like to get to the point where, you know, my job is something that I own and have created. Um, whether that be like in the form of a business or something like writing wise, like a novel or screenplay, whatever, you know, I just like want my job to be something that I have control over more than anything else. So I think that's probably a dream for a lot of people especially now sure. living in, yeah. in 2023 where it's <laughs> not very easy at all to accomplish that goal so <laughs> yeah no kidding yeah that's a, that's a really interesting kind of take on that that's cool yeah uh, yeah i like that that's pretty unique mm -hmm. most people i think when they think about that question answer with like a, a job like that they are working towards which is a fine answer there's nothing yeah. wrong with that um, but that was interesting. That yeah. was a good answer. I don't know. I think I'm just... I know we're not supposed to talk about this That's fine. We're here much. now. Um, <laughs> I think it just, like, I came to uh, a realization a while ago through doing a lot of mental work, especially in therapy, that, like, I don't... Like, nobody has to have, like, I want to accomplish this very specific goal, right? Mm. You know, I feel like a lot of times, like, you grow up thinking you kind of need to have a very specific goal to achieve, but... I think like if you leave those things more broader, then you're kind of more op open to opportunities of like, you know, creating something you thought you might never do. Yeah, that's very interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, so now we know a little bit about you and the way that your life is panned out. Because ko koalas being your favorite animal are vital for us to know. It is very vital, who you are. honestly. Yeah. They, the reasoning being, by the way, is because they sleep for 23 hours a day and oh, eat man. for the other hour. And that's just all I aspired to be, to be what honest. A life. <laughs> what a life. Um, so that lets you know just about everything you need about a person. So, so it really does <laughs> contribute <laughs> to who you are. Anyway. Um, because this podcast is all about stories and you selected Avatar to go over specifically, um, but to get to know kind of how you look at stories and, and engage with them, what is your favorite medium of story? Yeah. So I would say for a very long time, it was probably books. Um, 
I was like very into, especially like as like a teenager uh, and like young adult, basically very into like reading stories and using my own imagination. And now I find myself gravitating more towards like shows and animes more than anything else. I would say, yeah. I have definitely slowed down on the reading side, sure, which sure. I think happens to everybody, you know, at some point or another. But uh, I would definitely say now, at least, it's definitely like shows and anime and stuff like that. Cool, 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 cool. Uh, so, and this is a big one. What is your favorite story that you've so far engaged favorite with? Favorite story. This is a difficult question. Yeah, it's, it's a hard to one. answer. Um, I'd say my favorite story uh, of all time is probably Berserk. Okay. Um, just because, like, the plot, it, it's just one of the most incredible plot lines and character development stories that I've like ever encountered. I think so. That would definitely be it for me. It is. It's very good. That's a very good, I mean, it's a good answer. Yeah. Um, so who is your favorite character of all time? Another <laughs> small question. Just, not a lot to not, think about here. Yeah, not just hard breeze at all, through. honestly, to think about any of these questions. Yeah, like, <laughs> just of all time. Like, yeah, who's, just, just of anything, just ever. Just of anything, ever. Um, so uh, I spent some time, especially today, thinking about this, like who is my favorite character of all time. Yeah. And I think I'm actually uh, going to go in the direction of L from Death Note being my okay. favorite character of all time. Um, just wow. I like I've watched and read Death Note like so, so many times, like countless times at this point. Um, and each time I go back, like I like L a little bit more. And, mm. like, he wasn't the first, like, my favorite character, even in my first, like, read and watch through of the show. Um, but, like, mm. over time, like, it became, like, he was just my favorite, you know? Yeah. So, I really love his character and everything. Yeah. And this isn't the Death Note podcast, but... No. I... You know, I found the same kind of thing happen to me. Mm -hmm. I always... Light was my favorite character, and, you know, still is in the running for me. I, he's a great character. Um, but like as I reread or watch it again, no. I like L. L stands out more. I don't know no. what that is about maybe getting older. Getting or older, I don't and know. You like L more, I don't. Know. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, but so that leads me to the next question, mm -hmm. mainly because I wouldn't consider L a villain. No. Who is your favorite <laughs> villain of all time? Um, so my favorite villain of all time, I know like all almost all of these anime answer is going to be anime or ma manga based just right. because like you know you know i'm into that world so oh, much yeah. as well um but aizen is my favorite of all time to be That's honest such a good um, answer. he is like one of the most intelligent and also at the same time one of the most manipulative mm. and like one of the most powerful villains i think like ever encountered like in my mind Ichigo shouldn't have won, right? But yeah. that's not... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Aizen's a very cool villain. Yeah. Bleach is a good show, too. I love Bleach Not the Bleach well. show, but Again, very good. not the Bleach show, but it's very good as well. <laughs> Very good. That's a great answer. Um, and so, now, I'd like to give the opportunity to, to guests to shout out a story, uh, not unlike what we've been doing for yeah. the past several minutes. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Something that's like impacting you recently, or mm -hmm. you know, that you want to shout out. Do you have a story like that? Yeah, I do. Actually, I was actually going to shout out. I mean, it is kind of, you know, the offshoot of what we're talking about today. But the Legend of Korra, I wanted okay. to shout yeah. out because I think uh, a while ago when it first came out. I tried to watch it and didn't really give it as much of a chance. But recently, actually, when I went to rewatch Avatar for the show, uh, Caleb, my boyfriend, was like, we should, uh, like, watch Korra, too, because you haven't seen it. And I was like, okay, you know, whatever. And I ended up actually loving it, like, so much. So that would definitely be the show I want to shout out. I know that a lot of people have very mixed feelings about yeah, Legend of Korra divisive. as well. Um, yeah. But personally, I thought it was great. I thought we got to see, like, it made more sense to me, like, the, the storyline of the Avatar after watching Korra. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is also a great series. I, we, 
I don't think could jam any more into this no. podcast. Nope. But that's a good shout out because yeah. I mean, if you've if you've listened to me and you went and watched Avatar when I told you to earlier in the podcast, <laughs> just go right into Korra. Just yeah. keep going. Just just keep going. You yeah. can watch this first and then go right into Korra. Roll right into it, you know. I don't think there will be major spoilers for Korra in this episode. No. I don't no, think so. I don't think so. I don't think we'll talk about it Might probably at all. Might touch on it slightly, yeah. but that's probably about it for today. Yeah, so. Yes. Uh, so my shout out um, this month is is a manga. I just finished reading a manga um, called Demon Slayer. It's really popular. It's <laughs> not like, that's not a foreign thing for me to throw out the anime is incredible i actually encourage watching the anime instead of reading the manga no shade to the mangaka i'm a big manga guy as you know (laughs) but uh ufotable did an incredible job of of animating that show Mm -hmm. so i think it's definitely worth watching but it's just it's such a great way to do the for shonen formula as boiled down, stripped down, and just straight into what we're looking for. It's really good. So if you if you like that kind of battle shonen thing, this is up your alley. So definitely give it a shot. Um, it's good. Yeah. So, Kate, we're here to talk about Avatar. We Why are. did you choose Avatar? Um, so... <laughs> Sorry. The main reason I chose Avatar uh, was... Because I was going very back and forth, you know, I've even in this introduction have mentioned at least like five different shows or, or <laughs> right. mangas that I like, right? So like, I my brain has such a hard time being like, okay, what's the one thing I want to talk about? Um, and then thinking about it more, I was like, you know, it is the one show that I currently have like a tattoo to represent. So I'm like, that... Mm. I'm like, that for me was like, okay, yeah, we should probably talk about that first, you know? And then we can get into other stuff, you know? I obviously want to get other tattoos that are based off of other shows as well. But uh, currently, that's the one I have. And by the way, the tattoo that I have is uh, the White Lotus symbol, the pie show piece. I have it on my shoulder. It's like one of my favorite tattoos, if not my favorite tattoo. So (laughs) that's... Yeah, it's, I mean, that's a great tattoo. Out of all the, the like, Avatar The Last Airbender tattoos, mm-hmm. I think that's a great idea. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So when when was the first time you engaged with this story? Um, I don't know if I mm. quite remember the first time. It yeah. was definitely uh, when we were children. Yeah. When we were... I'm, I'm not sure, I can't remember exactly when it came out, or if we watched it directly when it came out, or if we watched it later than that. Um, I do remember watching it on Nickelodeon, though, like, as it was coming out. So, I don't know, it was probably, like, at that point, what, like, 9 or 10-ish, probably? Maybe yeah. 10-ish? I don't know. But that was, like, the first time I really encountered this show. Yeah. It's, like, when I was pretty young. Yeah, this is probably a good time to mention that we're siblings. Oh, yeah, we are so. Uh, we, we grew up in the really same house. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I'm just, just saying ran- we, and people yeah. are like, what are you, <laughs> we? <laughs> I didn't just randomly hang around you as a nine-year-old. No. <laughs> I was, we're siblings. Um, but we definitely, uh, we definitely watched this. We were in during the first season, during yeah. when book one, the water was airing. Yeah. Um, and I remember I remember I watching thought. the finale of, yeah. of book one when it came out and mm-hmm. stuff like that. So it, we were really young. You we were, were pretty really young. young. Yeah. Um, and we were big Nickelodeon oh, yeah. kids anyway. Mm-hmm. So we were already kind of on that channel. So, yeah, yeah we, it was really young. I was so excited when you picked this because for several reasons. Yeah. One, I love it. <laughs> Two, it does. It is something that I think you and I engaged with together yes. and at least on my end i didn't know like my best friend at the time didn't watch it mm-hmm. my i didn't know anybody else that was actually in it at the time now as we grew up i think everybody Everyone has watched it, it. Right. Like, even <laughs> that friend yeah. has now watched oh, it yeah, and absolutely. loves it but 
at the time that was something that you and I did yeah. and like we could talk about it so that was cool and also it's uh, it's one of my favorite things and I don't have to waste one of my picks on it <laughs> I can wait for someone else to choose it <laughs> yeah that is what you said to me before I picked this you were like I was gonna pick yeah. this and then you picked it so now I don't have to use one <laughs> so it just narrowed down my list of things I want to do <laughs> right exactly by one which is great um yes so I was very happy that you picked that. And so now we get to our question that was submitted to me, uh, which is, who is your favorite spirit in Mm -hmm. the show and why? Mm -hmm. Um, So I went very back and forth about this. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, but I think like also about, this is another one I kind of thought about today more, you know, um, I think like Wang Shi Tong, the the owl library spirit, is one of my favorite spirits. Um, this is another thing I was talking about earlier today as well. Is that like I understand Wang Shi Tong's point of view, of mm-hmm. like I open this library so that everyone can have knowledge, can gain knowledge. I have opened the doors to like people and spirits and whatever being able to use this massive collection of knowledge right and every time a stinking human comes in here (laughs) they're always looking for something to start a fight to like destroy something so like at that point i'm like i kind of get his perspective of, of yeah. being like, listen, I don't, I mean, he is kind of, you know, an asshole a little bit. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but like, I guess. But like, but, but like, yeah. I mean, I mean, to what ends? Like, the thing is, is like, he, I, I just have always understood his point of view being like, people always use this for the purposes that I don't want them to. So why would I, you know, continue to give this knowledge to humanity if you've proven, you know, time and time again that you're just going to misuse it? He's also really, yeah. really cool. He's just like a giant owl, oh, which awesome. is so awesome. <laughs> oh, he's awesome. That's crazy that you say that. Because my, my favorite spirit is also Wong Shi <laughs> I, I love him. Um... For all the reasons you said, <laughs> right. I, like, I think they're great. What what was the other spirit that you were waffling um, with? Yeah, so I was going back and forth. Um, ah, so I I do want to give a shout out to like Ko as well. Okay, it the, wasn't Ko. The face stealer. Uh, okay. Uh, just because that is a very interesting concept uh, mm-hmm. to like have, like especially a, a very rough. Uh, challenge for a kid show to have as well like that that was terrifying to me as a child watching ko and ang like having to not make any expressions or else his face would get stolen i was like genuinely terrified as a child like watching that happen right and obviously you know it's a different kind of spirit but and also the um black and white spirit the like panda oh, yeah. monster spirit that attacks like the the one village you know and hey, like bye? hey bye hey, that's bye. what it, it that's who it is yeah hey bye um i, yeah. I also like hey bye a lot too just cuz yeah. you know i get it you know i get the, the spirit's frustration yeah. with humanity in general you know right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, I, uh, yeah, Wong Shi Tong's so cool. Wong Shi Tong is Wong Shi Tong's the coolest. <laughs> I, I really like him. Um, but, alright, cool. So, let's get into the meat. The meat! Yeah, let's get it. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you might know, yeah. I think stories, essentially all of them, no matter the medium, have three parts. Mm-hmm. Um, characters, plot, and setting. Mm-hmm. Um, I've decided to be less rigid in my uh, <laughs> going through these things. Uh, but I still want to start with characters because mm-hmm. I still think that this will lead into the other conversations yes. um, as we as we go through. So, there is always a protagonist mm-hmm. and this story has one. Correct. <laughs> and his name is Ang. It's very clear who the protagonist yeah, is. It's story. not a mystery. <laughs> Uh, so, what do you think about Aang? What are your thoughts on him as a protagonist, as the central character of the story, all that? 
Um, I love Aang as the protagonist. I've always like loved Aang as being the protagonist of this show. Um, because I think it is a very like real reaction and a moment to what could possibly happen when being met with this information. Like you're telling a child mm. that he has now has the responsibility on his shoulders of protecting the entire world. And that he has to do, like, start doing stuff for it now. Like, he has to start learning how to face death in the face, like, now, basically. As a 12-year-old child, he's been yeah. t being told this by the people that, like, he grew up with, right? By the people that raised him, you know? Yeah. Like, that's genuinely terrifying. So I understood, like, you know, he runs away. He's stuck in that ice block for a hundred years and he comes back and he has this such a deep guilt then following that about being gone for that long. But at the same time, like, I, I just think he's such a great protagonist because we have like such a young kid having to face, you know, such dire situations and things that like, you know, any other 12 year old kid in this universe might have to face some of it, right? But they don't have to carry the responsibility of keeping the world in balance on their shoulders, right? right? So it's yeah. like, it's like, you know, it feels real. Like it feels like this is what a real 12 year old would do when confronted with this information. You know, I'm, you know, you might run away. You might like try and get away from whatever your destiny, you know, might be. And like, I, that's why I love Aang. Just because, like, he seems so real. And especially, like, with his reactions and stuff like that to finding the rest of the Air Nation being gone. Like, you know, him yeah. just having this visceral, like, immediately going into the Avatar sedate reaction. Um, like, I'm like, all this makes sense. Like, he's a 12-year-old. Like, being told that he's been gone for a hundred years and all of the people he's ever known and loved are dead. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, not all of them. Not all of them. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. Exception. We got one. <laughs> we got one, one good buddy left. <laughs> the one. And, Which is insane, by the way. Good, good buddy is strong. <laughs> good buddy is strong. Yeah. He's he is a yeah. I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> uh, what I like about Aang. What I, I mean, I like a lot of things about Aang, a lot of what you said. Um, I like how we can see his maturity mm -hmm. through the books, through yes. the, the story. Absolutely. Where when he comes out of that iceberg, he's a prankster. He, he likes mm -hmm. to joke around. He's very, he's fun loving. And he stays, I think, a little fun loving throughout the series. It's not like mm -hmm. he loses that. Right. But he begins to come to terms with what he has to do. Yeah. With, with what he must do mm -hmm. and and how he's going to accomplish that right and works towards that and this makes him a, a little more serious and a little more uh, thoughtful about how he's gonna do this impossible task mm -hmm. how is he going to restore what it feels like oftentimes he views as his own mistake mm -hmm. that it got this bad because I disappeared right which is something I like. And I mean, the storm as an episode tackles mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. as like he puts it pretty much plain out there yeah. that he does feel guilty about running away in the first place that led to this. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, and I think the show does a decent job of saying, like, even if you didn't run away, yeah. we still have problems. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's not. Yeah. Like, it's so, not all on you. Yeah, it's not of. all his. Yeah. And I think he comes to understand that. Yeah. And that he just understands the duty he has and the destiny that, that he has as the Avatar. Yeah. Um, I think he's such an interesting main character. An interesting character. Absolutely. Um, and having the combination of being raised by these monks mm -hmm. and now thrust into a world where they don't even exist mm -hmm. anymore. The closest thing, I guess, is Guru Patik. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He meets later, and yeah. he's not an airbender. He's not naturally no. from that tradition. He comes to it through meditation. Like, mm -hmm. I yeah, it's uh, Ang's really good. Mm -hmm. Ang's really interesting. Yeah. I, I like him a lot. Now, we come to the antagonist issue. Yeah, and I 
I'm going to say there are three antagonists, mm -hmm. one for each book in this series. <laughs> yeah. Although Ozai is, is always the overarching antagonist, okay. we do not even see his face. <laughs> For so long. Until book three. <laughs> until till fire, right? It is, yeah. It is the start of book three, I think, We just right? see his shadow. You just see his shadow up until, until then. Until fire. Until, until the last season mm -hmm. of the show. So, while he is this monster in the darkness, right. <laughs> he's not a present threat until the third book. Yeah. And so, in the as the face of the antagonist, we have mm -hmm. different antagonists. The first one being Zhao. Yeah. How do you feel about Admiral Zhao? <laughs> Um, so I don't really like <laughs> Admiral Shao as an antagonist no. that much. Uh, a little weak sauce as far as an antagonist goes for me. Um, I don't know. Like, I just think, like... I expect more from an antagonist than Zhao is providing, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> like Zhao is obviously, like, the antagonist in multiple ways, right? Because he's the antagonist to our protagonist, right? As well as being an antagonist to people like Zuko and people right. like Iroh and, yep. you know, like, all of these other people. Um, I do think that he is powerful, but I don't think he has uh, quite the planning or skill level to apply that in any way that would actually lead to him like capturing the avatar fully, you know. And I mean, he did. He did end up capturing him. Yeah. At one point, right? Um, but like, I don't know. It, he just has never seemed like a truly like formidable enemy to me you know yeah. in in the perspective of at least avatar you know yeah well i think this is one of the things where what they're trying to say with Zhao's character is is summed up in um i think the episode is called the deserter hmm. where they meet john john oh who yeah is, who was Zhao's master yes um and how they're talking about how Zhao is simply the pure destruction yeah. Of what firebending is, yeah, and that this like unhinged destruction will ultimately destroy the user, yeah, um, and that's like what Zhao seems to to yeah. embody, even all the way if we think about the end, yeah. which is terrifying. <laughs> I, I like Oof. that his end is <laughs> frightening. Wow, but, <laughs> yeah, I, like, but the reason, I mean. First of all, I don't know that Zuko's pulling him out of that, but no. <laughs> but Zuko offers his hand to like grab Zhao and stop him from being pulled into the water. He does. And Zhao pulls his arm back yeah. in pride because this like this arrogance and this destructiveness mm -hmm. ultimately leads to his end. Yeah. An end far worse than we knew if oh, you yeah. seen Korra. Very bad end. I, <laughs> but also I think often I've thought about Zhao as like incapable, like kind of dumb as a antagonist. But like Zhao made it to Wang Shitong's library. Oh yeah. He that's where he learned about the moon spirit and about mm -hmm. this like <laughs> this is part of the reason Wang Shitong's so angry. <laughs> it's like as we talked about. Just a little bit. <laughs> but like he so he does capable things. Yeah. It's just a lot of them we don't naturally see. Yeah. Um, and he's the villain. And he's yeah. the first season antagonist. Yeah. Aang is the weakest at this yeah. point. The group is the weakest. Like, mm -hmm. he's going to feel the weakest. Yeah. And in comparison... Oh, yeah. ...to the, to the second yeah. book's villain... He's he's a buffoon. He is a buffoon. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, so what do you think about Azula? Azula. Uh, so, Azula to me is a fantastic villain. She, um, she yeah. is, in my opinion, she is my favorite villain in this show. Couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> Like, I know that Ozai, he's supposed to be, like, this main overarching villain, right? Um, but my main thing I'm getting from Ozai is intimidation, right? Yep, yep. He's clearly incredibly powerful, right? In mm -hmm. in the firebending stance, as well as 
politically power stance. He's sure. He's, you know, the Fire Lord, so he has control of the entirety of the Fire Nation, right? Right. But to me, like, he is more intimidating than, like, genuinely fear-inducing, right? Yeah. To me, there's, like, this twinge and, you know, at the end, it kind of goes fully that way yeah. of, like, insanity to Azula, yes. of, like, narcissism and control and all of these other things that Azula has, that Ozai has in some ways, but I do think that even Ozai views Azula, his daughter, as, like, born purely evil, right? Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't think yeah. Ozai even views himself as born purely evil. I think Ozai has adopted, you know, the ideals of his father. And I don't, I'm probably talking too much about Ozai for us to, you know. That's fine. We're talking about we'll Azula. We'll get to Azula. <laughs> Don't you worry. She's not going anywhere. She's not, I'm just more doing this to set up for the fact of, like, Azula is, like, genuinely terrifying. Mm -hmm. She is so intelligent. And she is such a good tactician. She's so good at planning and finding people's weaknesses no matter how small and minute they might be and just stabbing that part right repeatedly and i think like we see this even in the very beginning of when we see her start to build her band of team right when she goes to ty lee right and the, she lights the net on fire oh, underneath poor ty lee first of all <laughs> that statement can just be a general blanket yes. over ty lee's life poor but ty yes. lee honestly just yeah. in general for the show poor ty lee yes. but like because like azula like she knows genuinely like how to manipulate people how to get large and small groups of people to do and follow what she says and she does this with the Dai Li. She is from the Fire Nation and takes control of the entirety of the Dai Li agents. Like that is like so terrifying. Like <laughs> Yeah. That's and that's I think maybe the best example. Right. Of she is she is definitely physically intimidating. She's yeah. she's one of the best firebenders we've seen the whole show. She's definitely capable. But that mentality is way scarier. Yeah. That moment where Long Feng comes back mm -hmm. in with the Dai Li. Yes. And they're in the throne room. Um and they they don't move. And yeah. she and he's like, What are you doing? She's like, they're waiting to see who wins. Yeah. And and essentially is like, I know who wins. You know who wins. Uh huh. What are you gonna do? Yeah. And like then Long Feng just crumbles. Yeah, literally I crumbles. Like, and like she, yeah, I, it's very, it's it's. She's she's terrifying. She is terrifying. She's terrifying. <laughs> she's so and that's scary. the whole thing about. It's such a contrast with mm -hmm. Zhao, yeah. who comes before, who we, honestly, only see fail. I, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know no, how he's see, moved up the chain of command. At all. <laughs> I, I have no idea how he's moved up the chain of command mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Ever. But um, but we only see him fail. I So as I was watching through, mm -hmm. I, I can only find, like, possibly, and I'm stretching, mm -hmm. two instances where you could say Azula lost. Yeah. Yeah. I... And, and I'm stretching one. Oh yeah. Because the one where they're in that desert town and there's five against one. Yeah. She still gets Iro on the way out. She does, yeah. And then runs. And then and runs. I'm, and I'm if you count that as a loss, which <laughs> I don't know you should. I don't know if you should, because it's five against five powerful yeah. benders against uh, and one. Sokka. <laughs> and Sokka. <laughs> I, it's yeah. Yeah, she's just... She's terrifying. She's, like, truly just, like, terrifying. And, like, you can see it in the way that, like, she manipulates Ty Lee and May mm -hmm. especially, you know? Like, and May has this kind of disposition where she doesn't really seem like she cares, right? Whether sure. Azula, you know, 
manipulates her or not, right? She's like, I'm just here just to, like, do something that doesn't make me bored, right? Yeah. Um, but even even May, in, like, the later times, goes against Azula yeah. and is, like, genuinely... That, to me, is one of, like, the most shocking moments, right? Is when, like, May and Ty Lee, like, finally, like, go against what Azula wants, right? And that, to me, is also, like... <sighs> what ends up being like her true breaking point, right? Yeah. Where she realizes she truly has no one. She's truly like been the villain her whole life and been trying to make herself more powerful and more well-known her whole life. And that has truly pushed everyone away from her. Like, it, and she even says it in the thing, like even my own mother thought I was a monster, yeah. right? And I'm like, that's because you are, you are a monster. <laughs> <laughs> that that beach episode well she even says she's like yeah. she was right of course she was but, right of yeah, course but like, it still hurt yeah. <laughs> I yeah she's she's very frightening yeah. that beach episode that last part of that beach episode is actually super impactful for mm-hmm. all the kids that are involved it is yeah in that it is especially impactful like and I was even, like, I was going to talk about that episode possibly a little bit later, too. But, like, um, that just, like, the amount of just development that happens, especially for Zuko in that one episode, you know? Yeah. Um, of, like, realizing, you know, these aren't the people I want to be with. Yeah. Like, these are... <laughs> the, I don't know what direction in my life my life is going, and it's so confusing that, like, this is all happening to me at once, right? Like, that episode is so good. And also for Azula. Like, yeah. just, like, being, like, almost having this moment of self-realization of, like, people don't like me, just yeah. in general. And, and it's not because I am the Fire Lord's daughter. It's yeah. not because of anything, right? It's because I'm unlikable. Like, yeah. <laughs> There's something about me that is wrong. And she, and what's more terrifying about that is she recognizes it and chooses to do nothing to change it because she knows it makes her more powerful and like more, more able to manipulate those around her than if she wasn't like that. She doubles down on it. She doubles down. (laughs) And the sad part, so like, this is why the end is so sad. Yeah. Or her, the end her of her ending, story, yeah. uh, is is so sad as she kind of devolves into madness. Yeah. Um, it's not only I think the show makes it pretty clear that her nature itself is is evil, is is yeah. bad. There's something wrong with her. Yeah. Um. But even the way she was nurtured, mm-hmm. she's not. Not only does she have these unempathetic traits, not only is she manipulative and all this Mm -hmm. stuff but she's rewarded for being so yes over and over yeah and so she's so of course she leans into it yeah uh, because this is what you're being praised for on top of the way you already were gonna act this way yeah i yeah she's she's very interesting i love how good how resourceful she is she Mm -hmm. i this time i never noticed this until Mm -hmm. this wash through but when they're on the airships, yeah, and Zuko and her are on top of them, you know, throwing each other around with fire, um, and Zuko gets saved by Appa, and she's falling, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Is she, is she gonna drop?" Mm-hmm. And she like fire blasts herself toward the wall, and she takes her hair, her royal hairpiece out, and stabs it into the cliff face, yeah. and that's what holds her there. Yeah. I was and Zuko says something like, "Of course she isn't. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, she's definitely not dead." Yeah. Like, <laughs> uh, like, I was just like, the the resourcefulness is so cool. Like, yeah, she, yeah I mean, she's terrifying, but like, <laughs> this is what makes her, I think, a, an amazing villain. Yeah, um, and a great, a perfect foil for Zuko, and I think yes. this is a problem. Not a problem per se, but something they figured out in the final fights. Yeah. They, Zuko had become so much of a character, so much of an important uh, uh, piece in this puzzle that he needed, he needed his own villain. 
Right. And that's why she doesn't disappear after book two. Mm -hmm. She stays and still very yeah. much a villain because she's Zuko's villain. Yeah. She's Zuko's enemy. Exactly. Um, versus the fire, you know, Ozai is Aang's. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about Ozai. We don't have to go too much mm -hmm. into that. I think what could have helped Ozai yeah. maybe feel a little closer to that, to how I feel about Azula, is if we just had more time with him. Yes. I think part of the problem is I had so much time with Azula. Mm -hmm. I yeah. Had, we had a ton of time with her. So much time. Um, and so we just didn't have that much with Ozai. No. And yeah. so I don't feel like I know him as a character that well right. other than this scary guy. Right. Like, it's just kind of like you know him in a in a generalization kind of way. Like, yeah. you know that he's doing the ba this, these bad things. You know that he is purposely trying to conquer the entire world, right? Going, like, however yep. he's going to try and do that, right? But he's just, like, not, I don't know, as genuinely fear-inducing. And I think a lot of that is because he doesn't get as much screen time as Azula does, you know? Um, like, yeah. because basically with Ozai, like, we know some of the bad things that he's done, right? But I don't think, like, we know the full scale to which, like, he has gone to try and conquer the world, right? Right. Like, the main, I think, bad thing we know about him is that he challenged his son to an Agni Kai and burned him, right? Yeah, cool. <laughs> which is, like terrible to think about sure. right like you would never you know you're a father as a father you would never do anything slightly like that to your child um <laughs> i don't i don't think so <laughs> well here's the Take thing a minute to right here's a, here's a quick aside <laughs> so the other day oh my he looks his mother dead in the eyes mm, yeah takes his toothbrush uh -huh. and chucks it in the toilet Oh, wow. Yeah. This is just, this is That's... maddening. <laughs> and then he looks at you and he goes, don't throw things in the toilet. <laughs> at that moment, I think maybe it is time for an Agni Kai. Might... I think, it, I think... Might, it might feel like time for an Agni Kai <laughs> at that moment. But I know you as a person, you might have yeah. that initial reaction, mm. but you, you're you never going to go through with that, right? No, I'm probably like, not going to. You're not following the thought, whereas Ozai did follow the thought. He did, like, gonna... brandish his son for his entire life. Yeah, I probably wouldn't. Yeah, I probably wouldn't. <laughs> I hope I would not. like to be on record. <laughs> Sh Shania and any government agencies that are listening. <laughs> He is not I, challenging his son to an no, <laughs> I am not going to burn my son in any capacity. Dear FBI agent that's listening. <laughs> or punch him in the head either. No, <laughs> anyway. no, no abuse. Yeah, child abuse aside. Yeah. Um, which <laughs> is kind of prevalent uh, That is what story. we were talking about. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah he... As a, as a villain, I think Ozai serves the role they want him to serve. Yes. Which is... A massive physical threat. Exactly. He is terrifying. Yeah. And when we see the final battle, he is is it's a crazy display of power. Yeah. So he does that. He does mm -hmm. that fun. Um, but Azula, I think, carries most of that psychological villain yes. weight for the series. And I get that. And even like from um, like the last fight that Azula and Zuko had, right? Yeah. Like it, I think is one of the most like important in development things for both of them, right? Um, Azula yeah. is like very rapidly declining into madness at this time, right? She, before this, has lost like the only two people that she actually trusted abandoned her because she is mm. insane, right? <laughs> Yeah. And from that point on, she starts to feel like there's nobody she can trust. So you see, like, she starts banishing everyone yeah. from the palace out of the Fire Nation, right? When, yeah. like, Ozai, like, makes her Fire Lord because he's now, like, the Phoenix King or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, like, and you can see, like, this rapid decline that even just, like, a small bit of power after that has been applied to her like with her already declining that just sends her deeper into it right and then yeah. you get this moment where she's facing off against zuko right 
And she's like, she's going all out. Like, this is the strongest we've ever seen Azula. And I think not just because, like, you know, it's the, what is it, the solstice or something like that? Or no, the solstice is the, the other one. Yeah. It's the, um, it's yeah. Sozin's Comet. Sozin's here. Comet, that's what it is, yeah. Um, like, and it's not just because of that. Like, she's not just more powerful because of that. Like, she's even more powerful so because I think she has fully given into that insanity at this point. She doesn't care about who lives or dies anymore. She only has this mind of I need to keep moving forward. And I think, like, there is something about that last fight that seems genuinely terrifying about her. Like, just yeah. the the way that she has so little concern for a res even, like, you know, a respectful battle to take place between her and her brother, right? Like, a final, like, this right. is the last stand between the two of us, you yeah. know? And she she cheats. Like, she doesn't yeah. she doesn't do it correctly. Yeah. Like, a battle she should be able to win. A battle she should, she should think. easily be able to win at this point, she yeah. thinks, right? Um, but she doesn't because, and I think that's also because of this insanity. Yeah. She is incredible in the early show at yeah. tactical planning and skillful thought. But because of this decline into absolute insanity, she loses all that. Yeah. She can only focus on what's directly in front of her anymore. And that's what makes her lose, you know? Yeah. Like, that's what ultimately screws her over. It's like she can't think like that anymore she's just thinking attack 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 she's not having any of those like thoughtful decision making moments you know yeah yeah and Zuko even says when they show up him mm -hmm. and Katara uh, Zuko said like Zuko agrees to the Agni Kai and yeah. Katara's like why are you what fighting are you a one on one right. and he's like something's off I can mm -hmm. win like like he gets that yeah, yeah it's it's she's very interesting the antagonists mm -hmm. the antagonists are all kind of interesting in a, in their own way but she's definitely i in my opinion sounds like in yours too yeah uh, the best the best antagonist oh, that yeah. the the series has to offer oh yeah um so uh, normally i would just ask about what other characters you want to talk about but uh i think we should start with zuko and the reason <laughs> i say we should start with zuko is because while he's not the protagonist, mm -hmm. I think he is the next closest yes. to being a protagonist in this show. Mm -hmm. So w what do you think about Zuko, his story, his progression, yeah. all that? Yeah, I love Zuko as a character. You know, I love um, the progression that he goes through from the beginning of like... You know, I need to do this for my f father. I need to regain my honor. I have, like, disappointed my family, essentially. And I need to regain that favor. Um, whereas, like, the whole time he's doing this, there's, you know, his uncle yeah. in his ear yep. over here, like... Do you have to, though? Like, do you exactly have to? He's not... He never explicitly says this, right? He's never, yeah. like... Especially when Zuko is really deep into, yeah. like, I need to find the Avatar. I need to capture the Avatar. He's never like, Zuko, maybe we shouldn't, right? <laughs> He's just like... Let's just go home. Yeah. <laughs> He's never, he never says or that because he knows but... he knows it would be useless to say yeah. that to him in any of these moments. He knows that his... His, you know, nephew would just get mad at him and probably kick him off a ship, you know, like, sure. <laughs> even though he doesn't really have any standing and Iroh yeah. has much more standing yeah. in anything than he does. He didn't have to go with he you. He did not have to <laughs> go. He wasn't banished. No, he, he was, was not banished. So, um, but it's just like, uh, like not specifically saying that, but just like having that. The thing on your shoulder of just like, this is the one person in your family that's always been there for you. Yeah. Even when you're banished, he's still there, right? It's just like his presence alone, being there all the time, is reminding him there are actually other options. Yeah. Right. You know, like, even even if he doesn't consciously recognize that at first, you know, like he's he's like going through all of these motions to try and win the favor back of 
his dad and the Fire Nation yeah. and doesn't realize that his father has given him an impossible task. His father has basically said, go go find like the golden yeah. egg and bring it back yeah. to me because the, uh, the Avatar has been gone for a right. hundred years and no one in the Fire Nation has been able to find him. Yeah. He gave him... Like, his father does not believe in him. His right. father does not yeah. believe that he can complete this task. Yeah, it's pretty explicit. <laughs> <laughs> Might even be said. <laughs> like, his father his father never believes that he can actually do this, right? Like, yeah. and, but, like, Zuko, Zuko still thinks the best of his father, though. At the yeah. beginning, at least. He still thinks, yeah. if I capture the Avatar, I will be welcomed back in with open arms to my father, right? Yeah. And that's never how it was going to go. Even if you dropped the Avatar, you know, at his feet, yeah. that's never how it was going to go. Because Zuko has always been different from all of the rest of them. Yeah. Zuko has always, in his heart, been more kind and gentle than any of the, than like Ozai or Azula, right? Or yeah. even his grandfather, you know? Like, yeah. Um, and it's just, uh, I, I just love his character development so much too. And also the like conversation that happens surrounding his paths and his mind drastically changing and that actually physically affecting him to the yeah. point of illness. Mm -hmm. Like that, that to me was such an amazing thing to display in a show because it's true. Yep. Your mentality, you know, what you're going through mentally affects what happens to you physically. And I think like that was like one of probably the first times I had ever seen that play out in a show, right? Where, like, mm -hmm. somebody, what they were going through, their emotional turmoil was actually causing them to get, like, physically sick, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, like, one of the hugest moments in that as well, in his yeah. character development. And then even after that, even going back then to the Fire Nation, yeah. you know, and being welcomed. And right. And still realizing that there's still something inside of him that is different from everybody, you know, mm -hmm. because they're sitting there and talking about how do we best conquer these places? How do we best kill these people? And he's sitting there like, I thought I always wanted to be in this room. Mm -hmm. I thought yeah. that my one purpose in life was to be here sitting next to my dad. And now that I'm here, I hate it. Yeah. This is the worst. He's like, and he even has that moment where he's like, I'm so mad. Why am I not happy? I should just yeah. be happy. Like, yeah. Because this That's is the everything. Beach moment. That's yeah. the beach moment. This yeah. is everything I've ever wanted. So why am I not happy? Yeah. And I'm like, it's because it's not who you are. Like, it's not who, it's not who he ever was deep down inside. And that's what, after he goes through a lot of this, his uncle tries to start telling him is that, yeah your path is not going to be defined by what your father does or says. It's going to be defined by what you decide to do, yeah. right? Which path you decide to trek, you yeah. know? Like, I just love Zuko so much. It's the Zuko quote he says in the basement, <laughs> yeah. or in the, uh, the Dai Li's base. Yeah. You know, it's time like, to look what inward. What do are, you want? <laughs> what do you yeah. want? Like, when he's screaming at him there, yeah. and it like, Oh my gosh, that's just also one of the, like, most, like, incredible moments, too, is when, like, Zuko has, like, found Appa there, and he's yeah. like, the Avatar's bison, now I have the Avatar's bison, I don't know what to do with him, but, like, I have him, you know? Yeah. And his uncle's there, like, what next? What now? Yeah. What are you gonna do? What do you mean you have him? You gonna like, bring him home? You gonna bring him home? He's not gonna fit in our like one bedroom apartment, buddy. Like he's he's a giant air yeah. bison. Like this is a bad plan. He's like, what are you gonna do? He's like, your your decisions up to this point have led to this moment, and now you have to decide again, like which path you're gonna go down. And, you know, you have to make that decision. I can't make it for you. The Avatar can't make it for you. Your father can't make it for you. You have to make the decision of, I'm going to do this or I'm going to go in a different direction. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And he... He's such a great depiction mm -hmm. of this idea of, of... His struggle between what is right and wrong. Yeah throughout the whole series. I mean, we see this, he has that dream while he's sick. Yeah. 
he has the dream of the blue and the red dragon that are talking to him. And yeah. one's eye, the red's Iroh and the blue's Azula. Yeah. And this moment happens then later in book two. Yeah. Where Iroh and Azula are arguing mm -hmm. with him mm -hmm. and he picks Azula. Yeah. And like, I, it's, it's such a great depiction of this mm -hmm. struggle between oh, good yeah. and evil that we see him make. And he, then he makes the wrong choice and it's mm -hmm. completely unfulfilling. Yeah. He's completely lost himself and he's more angry than he's ever been. Yeah. I that that's, that's such a like great moment. That's like the beach moment, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the beach more moment. More angry than I've ever yeah. been like <laughs> I should be happy, I but I'm be not. Happy. Yeah. I Yeah. And then <laughs> I oh. I and like I don't know, we'll probably have to talk about this moment now, but I my my favorite moment quite possibly in all of fiction. Mm -hmm. I, is is when he returns at the end to Iroh in the tent. Oh this might gosh. be my favorite moment ever. I'm gonna like cry, like just it, talk. I about did it cry I watching cry. it. <laughs> I, hate, I hate, I hate crying in public. <laughs> I hate it. I, I look, like, but I did first of all several times. Mm -hmm. I teared up on this watch. I'm just soft now. You're Something has soft. happened to me. I had a kid. <laughs> And I got so Now you feel all mushy inside. I, all, it's squishy <laughs> in there. And it's disgusting. I hate it. It's gross. Oh yeah, I'm a cry. Every time every time it's uh. it's uh Iroh on the hill singing leaves to the vine to his son, and when Zuko and Iroh yeah. reunite at the end, it's just absolute yeah. like I cannot stop the tears from coming. It's one of those mo keep keep going though. Yeah, no, I don't care. I <laughs> I'm gonna ignore the lease from the vine right We're now. We'll talk about Iroh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put that on a shelf. Um, I, uh, but no, like speaking about Zuko's role yeah. in going and returning, the fact that he he goes into the tent, sees he's sleeping, and sits there and just waits. He doesn't wake him up. He doesn't do anything. He just waits. And then as soon as I gotta like collect myself here, I like. <laughs> As soon, but as soon as he wakes up and he sits, mm -hmm. he's turned with his back to the wall. Yeah. And Zuko, like with tears in his eyes, is just like, I'm so sorry. Like, because he's gotten it. Yeah. And he's, just, he's so incredibly remorseful for what he's done. And because then he got it the whole time. Mm -hmm. He's like, the whole time you were there. The whole time you were my father. You were the one who was here for me. And I kicked you in the face. Like, I... I betrayed you. Yeah. And I get it now. I didn't get it then, but I get it now. It's like the humility that it takes to do that. It's hard. It's so hard to do that in real life. Yeah. A lot of times we don't always understand when we're yeah. wrong like yeah. like that. But even when we do, it's so hard to, to do that in real life. And it shows what a progression Zuko as a character is made mm -hmm. in in this constant fight between the the evil nature of his his father and the the legacy that he has mm -hmm. and and the good nature of who Zuko really is. Yeah. That that Iroh saw in him mm -hmm. even when he was a kid. Yeah. Iroh saw it all the way back then. Yeah. And that's why Iroh's here. I He's an amazing character. He's an amazing addition to the show mm -hmm. um, because he depicts it so well. He depicts this struggle that's so real. Yeah. I mean, we like to always think we're good. Yeah. But but there's a lot of times that we're not. There's a lot of times we make oh, yeah. a decision that is not good, and that sometimes we even know isn't isn't good. Yeah. And so it's just it's such a great depiction of that. So it goes really good. Great. Yeah. I. Uh, I don't. Do you want to go right into Iroh? <laughs> I mean, we can. Yeah, okay, I'm. Yeah. I'm down to talk about Iroh probably yeah. all day. So you might have to cut me off. At some no, that's Iroh's. <laughs> Iroh is one of the best characters in the series. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Um, first of all, there's so much more I would like to know about Iroh. Oh yeah, that has not been like keyed into in the show. Like, we were also just talking about this earlier, how, like, we need to have, like, an Iroh movie or something yeah, like that, yeah. where we, like, see, like, his early life, like, his capturing of Bossing Say, yeah. him, like, doing all of this stuff, and, like, 
him going to the last dragons and then deciding not to kill them but tell everybody that he killed the last dragon yeah. like <laughs> there are so many moments that i would love to see that like yeah. we haven't actually like seen that were just talked about he traveled into the spirit realm as a person right. also which is just something he just casually talks about casually yeah. mentions yeah oh yeah i'm in tune with the spirit world because i've been there yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. uh okay just random <laughs> random dude can go into the spirit realm that's yeah. fine um but i don't know i i love iroh so much as a character um because, like, Iroh is, like, the pure embodiment of, like, unconditional love. Like, for the entirety it's <laughs> incredible. of the show. Like, full, like, and, you know, like, Zuko, you know, he recognizes that he does mess up. He yeah. does some terrible things to Iroh. Mm -hmm. He does some horrible things to Iroh, you know? Like, he, like, goes on the side of his sister and lets him be arrested by the Fire yeah. Nation. Lets him be, like, captive there. And while he's in prison, he goes back and yeah. yells at him, you know, yeah. like, half the time. He's like, why are you just some stupid old man, <laughs> you know? Like, which is, like, so messed up. Yeah. But, like, through all of this, through everything... Iroh is like sitting there like I still love you yeah I still love you I know that you're just lost right now and yeah. that like you you can get back to where you need to be yeah. but like he recognizes that Zuko isn't bad Zuko isn't a bad person and like I think he sees this in like everyone in a way that like he yeah. doesn't see people as like kind of black and white there are like people that are all evil and people that are all good i don't know he might see azula as all evil i'm not gonna lie <laughs> it, seems like a theme. it seems like he yeah <laughs> that everyone is just like yeah people are nuanced people are nuanced except for, except azula. for azula she is she's just not nuanced. <laughs> she's just the embodiment of evil <laughs> but, even, but even that's not true yeah. because even we do see that she is nuanced yeah she is how nuanced. crazy it drives her to yeah. be totally alone yes anyway yeah absolutely we've, we've, we've talked, talked about, about azula, azula. <laughs> <laughs> but uh but anyways yeah with like iroh yeah. and everything like there's just so many moments there's so many things that we don't know about him and there are so many things that we do know about him everything that we do know about him is like makes him the best person that ever lived to me yeah. in my opinion yeah. like he like there are so many moments where i'm like how how was he when he was younger you know because like yeah. he he had to have changed at some point right mm -hmm. because he was like raised by his grandfather on the same kind of bs that ozai was raised on right, right. like we are the most powerful nation you know our way of do our way of being the most powerful nation is sharing that greatness with the world you know and conquering everything like but like and he bought into it for a time at least but it was really like i think the damaging loss of losing his son yeah. that made yep. him come to terms with everything he had done everything that he had done in like attempting to conquer bossing say I think he realized for a moment, like, I have been doing this. I have s been sending people to go and kill other people's sons. Yeah. Like, I have been doing this and it's just happened to me. And now I have this, you know, my own perspective about it, you know? And, like, they say, you know, Ozai or whatever says to, like, Azula and all the people that he's weak. Yeah. That he's weak for, for abandoning bossing, say for uh like not not fully conquering it for going back on that yeah. like but like that is like he he is one of the strongest people in the show to me honestly yeah because he like he goes through such a loss but is still after that grows like so much he grows exponentially like he yeah. realizes that he was wrong that like actually the way to move forward with life is bringing peace to the world it's not by you know creating more war war in the world and he and he tries to show that 
continuously and repeatedly to Zuko, mm. especially in the beginning, you know, yeah. by showing him, you know, we can let him go sometimes. Even if we have the Avatar in our grasp, it's not worth it. If yeah. it's if it's us, you know, if we're the ones that are dying because of it, you know, yeah. it's not worth it. Um, and he has like this this different perspective because he's gone through that huge loss of losing his son. And now he kind of views Zuko as almost his like adopted son, right? In yeah. a way. Because like obviously nobody's gonna replace Iroh's actual son. Sure. Right? Yeah. But like but I think he recognizes the fact that Zuko doesn't have a father, really, right? right. He has a man that tells him what to do all the time yeah. and like <laughs> and basic and banished him and, and basically said yeah go find a unicorn and then you can come back maybe <laughs> yeah. just real quick go hunt bigfoot <laughs> go find and bring bigfoot. his carcass go back. find the, go find the Loch Ness monster yeah. and bring him back for Cook me him up. and then and then you can yeah you can come back <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean that's it's like much. the recognizing the recognition that he has that like this this child doesn't have a father anymore and seeing those good qualities that are in Iroh you know in later in his life in Zuko and being like these can be fostered towards him actually being a good person decent person and he realizes I have to stick with him though if that's gonna happen because he needs then a constant example of unconditional right. love he needs that constant like I am always here for you whether you hit me, you throw me in jail, you, you know, abandon me, you called me an old, fat, lazy man, whatever, yeah. Yeah. I'm still here, right? Yeah. I will always still be here for you. And, like, that's... Oh, like, I, I see her <laughs> up just thinking about it. Like, every time I talk yeah. about Ira, I get so emotional. Yeah. <laughs> he's... He's not afraid to give... Like, when Zuko does visit him in jail, yeah. he doesn't respond. He's cold. Yeah. He's not... So so he's not afraid to be tough. It's no. It's not like he's permissive of everything. You're right. But he knows he knows what to do. He knows when to, to engage like that and when not to. Yeah. Um, and because then, you know, as soon as Zuko comes back and, and does and remorsefully, you know, comes to him... Ira, like, I, I'll never, I will never, for as long as I live, Aww. forget the line of, "I was never angry. Was never I was angry. scared you had lost your way." I and I believe I it. And I believe it. I believe it's true. It is I was true. Never angry. And then even when Zuko goes, "I did lose my way." Iroh's response is, but you found it again. Yeah. I like because this is what that's he's, the point. Yeah, this is what he this is honest this is what he went to prison for. Yeah. He didn't have to go with him. Yeah. I I believe he's strong enough to get out to oh, get yeah, out of that. Absolutely. I not even to just to break out of prison, but just to not be captured by Azula. Yeah. I think like he could have just escaped and ran. Yeah. But he, he does he does the things that he does to set up for this. To, to with the hope that so Zuko's going to come back around. So that he can find his way. That he's right. going to figure it out. Because he's already laid all the groundwork mm -hmm. in, we see in Earth yeah. for Zuko to, to get that. Now Zuko just has to make the right choice. Yeah. And he believes that he will. Yeah. And he, and he does. I, like, he does. At, that moment is incredible. That is Absolutely. the best display of of unconditional love I've ever seen. Oh yeah. In any story. Absolutely. I, it's yeah. It's just like that moment of like you know, he he doesn't believe that there's never been anything to forgive for him. Yeah. Like and there is so much to forgive from like yeah. an outside perspective. You're like he's so he did so many messed up things to his <laughs> uncle, yeah. right? Like <laughs> he called you a fat slob right? in prison. Like, like in prison. The prison he put you in. Yeah, the prison he put you in. <laughs> There's like, a couple reasons I could see. Yeah, like there are a couple reasons I could see for you to be like, yeah, you definitely need to be forgiven for this, you know? I ironic that Zuko called him a fat slob at his least fat. Yeah. In the series. <laughs> he is. <laughs> he balks fat. himself out. Yeah. 
But the whole, I mean, the whole point of that, though, yeah. is that he continues to, to carry himself so that he looks right, like he's yeah. still fat. <laughs> By the end of that, he's too. a ripped old man. <laughs> we, didn't that, we didn't even talk about how he's like a tactical genius. Oh, yeah. Oh, my I, God. Yeah, like, yeah. how does he, I mean, spirit world stuff. But how does he know there's an eclipse coming? Right, yeah. Why is he planning for that? You know, how does he, he know? knows that it's happening. He seems to know a lot about what's yeah. going on and what's happening and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah. Iroh's pretty good. Yeah, Iroh <laughs> is uh, like one of the most incredible characters. Oh. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the things... The thing about uh, the leaves from the vine, yeah, that episode. I, you know what I never thought about before hmm. this watch though. That this is this is where Luten died. Yeah, when he sets up that that like little shrine, that's where he died. That's where he died. I like what a great. I I don't know why I never put those pieces together. Yeah, but it was such a great like memorial thing mm -hmm. to do. It, it was very cool. The song's so sad. It's about a soldier boy who dies in battle. It's such a sad, such a sad song. And then even his quote of like, "I wish I could have done done this for you." Right. I wish I could have like all these things that he <laughs> spends the day doing. Right. And it feels like this really guides his life, like we were yeah. talking about. It's because he wishes he would have done this with Luten. Yeah. He wishes he would he could have done that 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 drives him to to do better mm -hmm. in general yeah i oh. and even just like having even before going in there before you like really know you know that like this is the place where iroh's son died right yeah. and being like my my dream basically has been to own a tea shop in bossing yeah. set right yeah. and you don't really like comprehend that at first right at first you're just like okay yeah it's one of the biggest cities ever who wouldn't want to own a thriving business yeah, in like sure. one of the biggest cities that exists right you're into tea <laughs> i get it i'm into stuff i get it thunders are cool you know whatever <laughs> sure um but then like you find out like this is this is the place where his son died like where yeah. You know all of that happened and like you come to the realization like that's why he wants it to be here it's yep. because like he wants to be close to his son in like whatever way he can be yeah it makes me so emotional oh my gosh i always get yeah. teared up when i talk about especially that moment and that like episode and everything like yeah. just like because it's so it gets to like everyone i feel mm -hmm. like like you feel yeah. All of the raw emotions that yeah. Iroh was feeling in that moment. And the only thing... And then we we got to move on <laughs> past Iroh. <laughs> but the only other thing I was thinking um, is that's admirable about him. Yeah. Is his understanding of his place in the world. Yeah. And what his destiny is. I love this... The quote he has when they are entering... Mm -hmm. When the old... When the Order of the White Lotus is lined up, yeah, and they're enter, they're getting ready to breach Bossing Say, and he says, "I had a vision when I was young that I would breach this wall, that I would conquer Bossing Say. I never would have guessed it would have been this way." Yeah, and so just like, first of all, that's a cool play on like the whole idea of like fate and destiny, and mm -hmm. us, even if even if we're sure, mm -hmm. not really knowing how, you yeah. know, like that's cool. Yeah. Um, like he knows he's going to do this, yeah. But he would have never guessed it was this way. No. And that's so like that's really cool. And just understanding like I can't be the one to fight Ozai. Oh. That's not my place. Yeah. That's not, that's not my role. And I love what's really my favorite episode in the whole series. Yeah. Is the third to last episode. Um, I think it's literally called the Old Masters. It's mm -hmm. Sozin's Comet Part Two, the Old Masters or something. Yeah. Um. Because where Aang meets with the past avatars, which mm -hmm. is so interesting. Yeah. And what the advice they give him. Hugely and has the Zuko Iroh moment we talked about. Yeah. But at the end of that episode, as they're like splitting up to yeah. do the various tasks, Iroh goes, um, 
destiny is with us. I know it. Yeah. And there's something about it that's so, like, it cool, like, encouraging about it. I don't yeah. know. I don't know what it is, but he's a very, like, he's just a very encouraging character. Oh, yeah. um, and one of the best examples of that sage archetype yeah. that I've ever seen in yeah. stories. Absolutely. But there are other characters. <laughs> There are as much as probably everyone in the universe. Yeah, like I could talk about Iroh <laughs> for for fifty years. Yeah. You know, there are other characters there in this are, series that are characters. also very good. You know, in an effort to not make this last another five hours, <laughs> um, what what other characters did you want to talk about? Yeah, I like if yes. just moving through them. So one of the main other characters I want to talk about for sure was Toph. Oh yeah. Um, so in- by the way, just real quick aside, because we have the time. <laughs> Dubious that was, <laughs> and now I'm Yoda. Uh, my like of Toph through the roof on this watch through. I don't oh. know what I missed before. Mm-hmm. I, she's incredible. Anyway, uh, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, I don't know what you were missing before. I, I, I don't know. About- I liked her. Yeah. I just not this much before. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah, I've like. You know, ever since, like, for a long time, it's been, like, for me, my two favorite characters in the show have been Iroh and then Toph as an an incredibly close second. Yeah. Right? Like, I, so much about Toph is so interesting, right? The fact that, like, um, like, her destiny, as they talk about this, was wrapped up into all of this as well, and, like, she never would have guessed that, you know? She never would have yeah. guessed that she would be the one to teach the Avatar earthbending, right? right? Like, being who she is, and the family that she's from, and, like, all of these other factors. Um, I just, I love so much about Toph. Um, just, like, the fact that she like is looked upon as this frail and fragile person but both her personality and her skill set are the exact opposite of what she appears to be right she invented (laughs) metal bending can we talk about that for a second how she invented a new type of earth bending to get out of like this cage that she had been put in right like she figured out how to do it and like that that alone is like incredible like she made headway in one of the nations that has been still thriving since the fire nation has been able to take over right like they've still at least in bossing say and a lot of these other places have been able to largely you know continue earth bending you know um but she's the one that makes the headway that like figures out how to do it right and is yeah. actually able to for the first she's the first one to even like imagine that it could be done right. she like always consistently thinks outside of the box and like that is like so huge for me is that like she you know despite everything that she's been through like thinks outside of the box that much too like and without the support of her family at all yeah. right like her her family doesn't like what she's doing like her right. her parents try to recapture her and bring her back home because they still have this image in her in their mind of she's too frail she's too fragile she's too weak mm-hmm. to do anything in this situation and i just love how everything about her personality is disproving everything that like people see about her immediately that's incredible also her sense of humor is like oh it's god tier (laughs) god tier sense of humor the the (laughs) moment where they're riding on appa and she goes there's it there it is (laughs) and everybody looks and she's like I can't, I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> she just puts the hand in front of her face. Like there's so many moments like that. There's so many moments like that. I one of the best. One of the things I love the best in this. At least she does it so many times. Yeah. Oh my like, gosh. Like somebody will hand her a piece of paper, and she's like, "What the heck <laughs> does this say?" The one. The one where also, uh, like Sokka is making the drawings of Appa, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. For, for the wanted posters, and then she's like, "I think it looks great, Sokka," and he's like, "Thank you." <laughs> 
damn it. Yeah, so good. <laughs> yeah, she's hilarious. I think like one of the best examples of this is when we look at the the uh, I don't know if it's called the play, but no. that episode towards the end yes. where they go to the, the theater and like this. everybody is upset. Except, Except for, for Sokka, who's mainly upset that the jokes need to be more on point mm-hmm. and goes and fixes that. Yeah. And Toph, who sees seeing like a giant man <laughs> playing giant it, is like man. that is the best. Is so <laughs> hype. Is, is like, so yes. hype about her care as about how her character is being portrayed. Yeah. She's like, is that's how I want to be seen? Yes. This is how, yeah. I, how I've always wanted to be seen by yeah. everyone, right? But nobody sees me like this, so I yeah. love that they're portraying me like this. Yeah. And they're like doing it to make fun of her. Yep. And she's like, I love it. It's just, it's, the best. it's that's great. Why, it's like <laughs> that's why I think her sense of humor. Is so good because yeah. while everyone else is so upset yeah. about their portrayals, yeah. Toph not only recognizes the caricature that they're making, yeah. but just loves it and just leans into it. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, yeah, she's great. She's a great character. I love how the blindness is actually what leads her to being able to think outside of the box in a yeah. way no one else in that universe could. Absolutely, yeah. This like, is why she's able to figure out there's Earth. There's Earth yeah. in this metal. Yeah. Um, and, and figure it out. And it's such an incredible, like, like Avatar does just, just such a good job of, I think, portraying somebody with a major disability. Yeah. And, like, first of all, showing how, in this situation, that disability is actually an advantage for right. her. In a lot of situations, right? Yep. Like, if you think about it, she can see further than any of us can. Ever, yeah. right? Like she if we're standing behind a building and there's somebody on the other side of the wall tra- like getting ready to attack you, she can see that person. Right? right? Like yeah. she <laughs> like yeah. like she uses all of these things like to her advantage as well. Like the fact that people think that because she's blind and because she's so small and young, like she won't be able to do anything. She uses all of this to her advantage, right? Yeah. And that's what she's like so smart about everything in that yeah. way, you know? And just like, and it's just always trying to present herself like, I'm not this, you know, small, fragile being that you think I am. Like, that is not who I am. It's never yeah. who I will be, you know? Right. Like, and I just I love it so much. I love it. It's really good. I yeah, she's she's really good. Yeah. No. I <laughs> we gotta keep going. We <laughs> 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 knew this episode. So <laughs> essentially <laughs> I only have two more characters I wanna talk about. Yeah. I don't know if you have more. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna have to rapid fire these two. Yeah, that's fine. We can. Which one do you want to start with? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, which one? You just say one, and we'll Let's go start with, with it. Katara. Yeah. Let's go with that one. <laughs> I feel like she deserves at least to be mentioned. Yeah, she she does deserve to at least be mentioned. I I will say. Uh, I liked her in more this, this time watch- too. By the way. Huh. I liked her more this watch through, by yeah. the way, too. That's what I was just about to say. Oh. Is that like I like this watch through I feel like there were definitely watch throughs where I hated Katara. Oh, where for I just sure. straight up hated Katara. Yeah. Like with all But this time I like actually kind of liked her. I was like, yeah. I I get it, you know? Like mm-hmm. she like there are very like a few parts of her personality that I don't like or appreciate, right? Sure. I do think that she treats this whole situation like she is the mother of all of these yeah. children, right? Nobody likes and the that's, mom friend. And that's a little weird, right? No, exactly. Nobody <laughs> likes the mom friend. Nobody likes Nobody the Nobody likes mom the friend. mom friend that's like, yeah, how, how much water have you drank I feel, today? <laughs> I feel like I need to have a caveat here. Yeah. If if you know me, yeah. and you were a mom friend, <laughs> maybe in college, <laughs> I love you. You're great. <laughs> Because I still, I still speak to you. Yeah, you were this great. This doesn't feel specific at all. <laughs> no. No. I'm pretty sure you're not listening. I'm worried your husband is. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you were great. Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm not saying there is honestly no, yeah. nothing wrong with people like that at all. To They're be often honest, annoying I've had in fiction. Yes, they are annoying in fiction. That's yeah. the thing. And like the difference between these people in fiction and in real life is drastic, right? Sure, like yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like in fiction, you kind of like don't really want to see people like that as much, right? Yeah. You're like, this is a situation where we don't need to have yeah. a mom figure, you know, right. step in. Um, but like they kind of do sometimes. Yeah. Like the the other three of them, mm-hmm. like kind of do need Qatar to be like the one that's like. Let's rein it in, yeah. kids. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. <And I laughs> let's think... wrap it up. Like, she she always leads them back to the point that they're trying to get to. And I think that that's important. What I don't particularly like is, like, she sometimes, at least I perceive her, to act as though she has been through more than Sokka has been through. Yes. And I don't like that. I don't like that she seems like that sometimes. Um, and she has it, right? Right. It, debatably, Sokka has been through more than she has, honestly. With, like, you know, obviously they both had the huge thing of losing their mom. Yeah. But after that, Sokka was the man of the village. Sure. He was the only man of the village. <laughs> and, and there are some and, heavy and, air quotes on yes, man. Yes, and there are some- <laughs> And there are heavy air quotes yeah. about, but at least like he feels then as a child this intense responsibility of like I now have to. It's now my job to protect all these people. Like yeah. you yep. know, and then after that, his first girlfriend <laughs> turns into the moon, <laughs> and that is rough. <laughs> and that's, as that's Zuko rough, says, buddy. that's rough, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm glad you kind of led into Sokka. I, I, so I want to talk about Sokka. What's, what's, um, this is why I put Katara first. Uh, what's wrong? Um, why, why I think actually, at least for me, this, this dynamic works. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's justified on Katara's part. Yeah. But I can easily see how we got here because Sokka almost lets it go that way. Yeah. So, because he's he's not that concerned about that grief part. Yeah. Because I think he is overwhelmed. He's flooded with with like this, like you said, mm-hmm. this responsibility to now be the man of this tribe. Yeah. At a such a young age, mm-hmm. he he's not, and he even says in one episode, he's like, I don't really remember what my mom looked like. Yeah. I I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, like, and so I think like, he's kind of. Saw like tried to forget about it, yes. Whereas Katara hasn't, and so yeah. then it feels like to Katara that yeah. Sokka doesn't care as much, right? When that's not true, and they even have oh. that argument, I they think they do, they absolutely do, yeah, yeah. So, like, I get, and this is why they have such different reactions to their father when yes. they first meet up with him. Sokka just wants to be seen. Yes. As as a man by mm-hmm. his father, whereas Katara is angry. Mm-hmm. That she, and it's not that she doesn't understand. She gets why he left, mm-hmm. but she's angry yeah. still. And she even says that. She yeah. even says, "I'm so angry at you, and I don't yeah. want to be. I don't know yeah. why I am." Like, <laughs> yeah. So I get that trait is definitely a one of Katara's I don't like as much. Yeah, but like I also, there were various moments in this watch through where I was like, I like Katara, you know? Yeah. Like, I understand, especially, I think like a big reason sometimes people don't like Katara is the wishy washiness she has with like whether she's going to have a romantic relationship with Aang yeah. or not, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. I'm, I'm like, I get that though. Sure. Because we're in a time of major war, right? Yes. Like, and she's like, Listen, Ang, I'm trying to focus on, like, yes. us living tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> like, That's 100%. <laughs> I never got that. Yeah. Until this watch through. And I'm like, Ang, she's 100% right. She's right. <laughs> she's like, right, bro. <laughs> and, she's, and she's allowed to say, yeah. I don't I don't want any part of this right now. Yeah. She's, that's fine to say. And I think, yeah. I yeah, it's I'm like, going to talk about Sokka. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to talk about I, more about Sokka. <laughs> I, know you, quickly, I know you love Sokka. As <laughs> distil- First of all, 
He's incredible. <laughs> Second of all, as distilled as I can get it. First of all, it's terrifying. It is it's terrifying to live in this world as a non-bender, as a warrior. Oh. I cannot imagine. Oh my god, yeah. Anyway, that aside, to try and distill my thoughts as far down as I can on Sokka. Um I think the amazing thing that his journey is, is we see him in the beginning, he's quite sexist. He's quite like he's he's bigoted. He's yeah. he's he's outright racist toward firebenders. <laughs> right. If you bend fire, he just hates you. Yes, correct. It doesn't matter what kind. Yeah. Like how like even to the point that it like starts to affect his perception of Aang. Yeah. In like when Aang starts learning firebending from Zhang Zhang. Yeah. Um I so like but what is so impressive about Sokka mm-hmm. is his ability to humble himself mm. in all of the times that he needs to humble himself. Absolutely. And so we see it right away with the Kyoshi Warriors mm-hmm. where he gets his ass, he gets his ass kicked. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then he comes back in and he's like, I'm sorry. I like, Will you teach me? Yeah. Will you teach me? Because he understands the, the value of this mm-hmm. and that he was just wrong. Mm-hmm. And like this is what then helps him all the way through this humility yeah. and this commitment to doing what's right, yes. no matter the pain. Even then, when he trains with Pain Dao, where he's like, um, he gets to the end of the training, um, and he's awarded the sword and everything. He's like, "You are worthy." And Saka goes, "No, I'm not. I lied. I'm not a fire nation. I'm not a member of the fire nation. I'm a member of the water tribe," because. Being honest, doing mm-hmm. the right thing, even if he has to fight him, that is worth it because that's what being a man is to Sokka. Yeah. It's it's being honest, humble, and doing the right thing. Yeah. And that's what's so impressive about him to me. And just like also the fact that I just want to quickly return to you quickly, you know, briefly said that it takes a lot of bravery and courage to be yeah. a warrior in this time where you know, he doesn't have bending and a lot of the people around him do. Yeah. Like, in reality towards the end, like, he is like one of the strongest warriors that exists, right? Yep. He is a trained Kyoshi warrior at this <laughs> point, right? Yeah. He's been trained by the debatably best master swordsman yep. in the entire world and deemed worthy yeah. by him like he has so many different aspects about him that I feel like people just put like Sokka on the side burner a lot of the time because he doesn't have bending abilities right yeah. but like especially towards the end his tactical skill and his yeah. planning he just like and towards the end he just needs more so of the confidence to make things happen more so than anything else towards the end, right? Yeah. Like, because at first you see, like, he's created this whole battle plan about mm-hmm. when they're going to go in on the eclipse, how they're going to do it, how they're going to make this stuff. But when he gets up there, you know, he can't say it. He's yeah. like, I, yeah. I can't do it, right? And yeah. then his dad steps up and helps him out and everything like that. But I'm like, that is such, like, a real moment that mm-hmm. you rarely see in shows like this. You always usually see the person actually stand up and be able to do it, right? But, like, you see this incredibly, again, humbling moment where he's mm-hmm. like, Yeah. I can't do this right yeah. now. I I can't. Like, I'm yeah. going to take a moment to step back and, you know, do whatever. But, yeah. yeah it's He's such a great character. He's a great I character. Love Saga. I, one of my only plot uh, gripe, maybe, mm-hmm. with this show is um it's not a very realistic training time speed no 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 <laughs> every time <laughs> this like saga becomes a sword master in like a day and a half right. <laughs> yeah I'm like, that's not that's not I how you know. become a sword master and I, well like based on the structure of the show i get why they do it you know all that stuff i'm not right. like I don't have any complaints because they execute the other themes of the show so well. Yeah. I just like, every time that <laughs> happens, they're like, Katara's a master waterbender. I was like, how long have we been at the North Pole? Wait, wait a like, second. Yeah. Why is she a, 
a thought master we, I thought we've been here for like a week. <laughs> I didn't think we were there for that long. Because oh. again, you have to think about the actual short span time that this show, like, yeah, it it's feels, it feels so long. Yeah. But it's not, realistically. Mm-hmm. It's like a little over half a year that this show yeah. is going through. Like, it's just it's, several months. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, did you have any other characters that you want to talk about? Before I leave that, I or don't mention, or I will say, uh, Jet's interesting. That's all yes. I have to say about Jet. I, I would also like to give an honorable mention shout out to Suki. Also um, very interesting. Because Suki's incredible. I don't mean <laughs> to throw Suki in the toilet. <laughs> She's a great character too. <laughs> Time is of the essence. Time is of the essence. I um, I would also talk about Suki forever, but we yeah. do have Time is of the essence. Okay. <laughs> the last thing. So, uh, the last thing, just to touch on briefly, mm-hmm. is the setting, like the world that this takes place in. Yeah. Now, I, the only thing I would mention about that is how interesting bending is is a power system oh yeah and how like fleshed out this world feels it's incredible it feels incredible yeah Yeah. i love how like it feels like a real world scenario right like if Mm. like the ancient world had bending this is how it would be probably right like everybody would kind of go into their different like factions of like this is where the earthbenders live this is where and non-benders are mixed in all around you know yeah like I, I love the setting of this world, too. And especially it being, like, more of, like, an Eastern setting. And, yeah. like, you know, not being, like, you know, the typical, like, Western kind of thing that we're used to with a lot of shows and stuff like that. It's, mm-hmm. like, it it takes place in a different, you know, time and space yeah. than we're used to. And I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. It's, yeah, and the care and detail that mm-hmm. they've taken in in creating the even the bending systems, and Absolutely. we'll probably talk about that a little more when we talk about the medium, but yeah. I, like, it's just cool. It's just a very fleshed out world, oh, a very, yeah. like, realized idea. Absolutely. Yeah, it's really cool. Before, before we leave the meat. The meat, yeah. Do you have anything else for the meat? Um, I don't, I don't think I have anything else for the meat. I feel like... The Wallace. I feel like we we covered a lot. We, There's so much to cover in this yeah. show that you cannot. It, it's almost impossible. We blitz. To do this. We blitz this ground. <laughs> I mean, there's there's still flames yeah, on the right. ground from where we just like, ran. Like, I feel like you could just talk about Avatar and yeah. all of the characters, yeah. like probably for two days, and yes. not be done talking about it still. Yeah. So I feel yeah. like for now, this is probably good this is place probably good. to leave it. <laughs> yeah. This is probably good. Okay, cool. (laughs) So, um, actually, before we move on from the meet, yes, there is one question that we might have like alluded to but didn't touch. Who is your favorite character? Um, I think we did actually talk about. Did we, t- did I we think touch this? I did say who my favorites were. Um, okay. I didn't. I don't yeah, think you really Iroh asked and me. Toph. That's, yeah. yeah, you did. Yeah, you didn't ask okay. me directly, but I did. Yeah, Iro and Toph are my top two. Nate. Um, my I would say my third favorite is Sokka, probably. Nice. Out of the whole series. Love to see Sokka um, making an appearance on love the top Sokka. ten list. Yeah, exactly. Um. But yeah, they're, those two though, they're, they've definitely always, pretty much always been in my top two spots. Yeah, know? I was thinking even back to when I remember watching it as a kid, and that was mm-hmm. true. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I always loved Iroh, I always loved Toph. I think there was a period of time where I did like Toph a little bit more than Iroh, um, yeah. but for the most part, uh, like at least now, I like Iroh and then Toph, which I think it's like, I always say my second is Toph because Iroh sometimes feels like a cheat of like your favorite character yeah. for Avatar. Yeah. Like, cause I feel like Iroh is almost everyone's favorite character, right? So it's not right. like, yeah, like, oh, it's really hard to, you know, think about who's the best person in the show. And obviously, you know, some people think differently about it, but 
he's such like a, an easy first choice I think for a lot of people so that's why I'm always just like you know Iroh is my favorite but yeah. Toph is very closely second you know yeah 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 my favorite I have a similar situation my favorite though is Aang yeah with Iroh as the closest second I get in, ima- you. in imagination yeah yeah um, yeah but yes so now that we've covered the meat <laughs> and there is a non-sleeping baby <laughs> you might be a little bit upset known, yeah um <laughs> I'm gonna let him thug it out in there. Yeah. Um, also, I'm gonna cut this out. Yeah. But. <laughs> okay, so now we'll get into talking about the medium. So mm-hmm. every story has a medium, a way that it's you know made and given to us that mm-hmm. we engage in, um, and I think sometimes talking about that can be interesting. Yeah. And so I just, what do you think is important about the fact that this was a cartoon on Nickelodeon? What mm-hmm. about that is important to, to the impact of the story? To me, like, that um, was just a way to see a very different kind of, like, kid show that I don't think they've really, like, you know, put, at least at that time, it didn't seem like they were putting anything like this, like this cartoon, like, on, like, children's channels basically like a lot of the the content on like kids channels was very like silly happy go lucky you know free for and that's what a lot of cartoons i feel like are like in general outside of at least the realm of like anime stuff you know yeah. that is more meant for people that are an older audience right um but it was like kind of one of the first times it seemed like that we saw something that was like really about these very groundbreaking ideas about morality, about what balance means, about what peace means, like about all these things and presenting them to an age group that is more around like the, you know, older child to preteen kind of meant for in that, you know, age range, you know? Um, And I just think like, they were able to do so much being it a cartoon um, with like the animation and especially with the bending. Like one of the most incredible scenes ever is Azula and Zuko's fight. It is animated so, so beautifully. Like just like the combination of like Zuko's orange fire and Azula's red Mm -hmm. fire, like in these, they're able to create these like truly yeah blue fire <laughs> yeah <laughs> but we got it yeah yeah it's blue fire. yeah um but they're able to create these like truly just incredible to watch moments with bending right yeah and we see that as well with like i think ang's last battle with ozai too and where mm. he's like using all four of these elements like to do yeah. crazy things you know um and even beyond that we like we see that there are like different ways to use these powers and i think like putting it in the context of a cartoon was the best way to convey like that message because you know when it comes to powers and abilities and stuff like that it's a lot harder to 3d animate something into like a real life situation than it is just to like you saw the uh the movie yeah i don't think we need to talk about the (laughs) yeah i mean that's been typically erased from canon yes um but but like it does go to show how around the same time Mm -hmm. uh the the differences in in what you can do with the different mediums yeah exactly like it definitely and i that proved it for me right like i mean obviously the movie was really crappy for a lot yeah, of for, different reasons yeah different honestly reasons, but um like calling ang ong the whole yeah, time what is was just anyway. like just made me want to blow my brains out but anyways, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i just like but you just saw like how like because it was a cartoon um, like e- children, I feel like can still 
absorb it in ways that they wouldn't be able to if it was like a real live action show yeah. um and it's like very important very deep philosophical conversations for children to be thinking about which isn't oh, yeah. usually what a lot of cartoons present all the time you know yeah. especially now i think they're are no children's cartoons really it seems like yeah. a lot of the times that present it in that way <laughs> yeah yeah i uh one of the things i and you kind of touched on the animation and how mm -hmm. uh, like almost groundbreaking especially for uh nickelodeon cartoon or yeah. any children's cartoon this level of animation was um, I think this is why a lot of people like will link Avatar with anime yeah. in some kind of way that nobody can quite <laughs> describe of right. why. And I think it's just this, it's a cartoon that mm -hmm. is made just in this way of a little bit more realism mm -hmm. than like Spongebob, mm -hmm. you know, like, yeah. I, and one of the thing, I mean, you're probably aware of this, but the, um, the, the fact that the bending styles are based on different real life martial arts yes. that, that they work so hard to, to mold that into mm. how they animate it, how mm -hmm. the moves work, I, I, such mm -hmm. a care to detail mm -hmm. is, is incredible. It's yeah. really cool to see. Absolutely. And I think it worked for it. Yeah, absolutely. Like, yeah. It was such a, like, there were so many times where I feel like I was just, like, it was kind of the first, like, anime-esque yeah. thing oh, yeah. I had seen as a child, you know? Like, it was the first animation style that was similar to yeah. that, right? So it was, it like, yeah. If I remember, I mean, it definitely is the first kind of thing like that that you would have been to. At the time, I had already been into Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Um, and probably Naruto a little bit. And you kind of by proxy had seen it. But this would have been probably the first like show that you were engaged in. Yes. Instead yeah. of just like, Absolutely. like vicariously yeah. hearing it from me. Yeah. And you know, like later then I got, you know, like a few years later, right. honestly, I got more into then starting to also watch like Dragon Ball Z and right. like Naruto and that kind of stuff. But yeah. yeah, it was definitely like my first like introduction to an animation style that is similar to it. Yeah. And, like, I'd, it was just very interesting and, like, groundbreaking, I think, for me to watch as a child. Mm -hmm. Like, seeing such, like, like an animation style that was closer to, like, what real life kind of looks like, you know? Obviously inaccurate in a lot of ways, but, sure. you know. Well, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's very cool. It's very good animation. The fight choreography is, in, is incredible. Oh my god. It's very good. Um, I also, I wanted to mention, uh, talk about the, the, um, wow, I'm blanking here. The soundtrack. <laughs> yes. Oh my That's god. That's what I want to talk about. Because I think it, the, the soundtrack to the show does play into it. I don't know what you thought about it, if you had yes. any thoughts. Here. Um, I love the shout, the soundtrack oh, of yeah. Avatar The Last Airbender, like, so much. I love it more than 90% of the soundtracks I've heard yeah. in, like, shows and stuff like that. I, like, just because, like, the music is so perfect for every situation that mm -hmm. it's in, right? Like, you have the fighting scenes where yep. it's always this very, like, you know, similar, like tone where it's like it gets you like hyped up oh, like yeah. it gets you like oh my gosh like this is an awesome fight and then they have like just all the different like music varieties like when they're going through the water tribe versus when they're in the earth kingdom versus yep. when they're in the fire kingdom and just like all of these different you know specific like kind of cultures that you're basically seeing you know accumulated here with like their different ways and styles of music and doing things but all of it being all of it leading back to this idea of like we're all people um mm -hmm. on this world you know that we don't have these huge major differences that we think we do and yeah. in that being the same way in the soundtrack, you know, mm -hmm. like there are slight differences among, you know, the fighting songs that you hear and all these other songs that you hear, but they're very similar to each other in a lot of ways. And I love yeah. that so much about the soundtrack. 
It's very cohesive like that, yes. I agree. I yeah. I love it when the the hopeful song and they use this song at the beginning, <laughs> usually in the intro a little mm-hmm. bit too. Um, I love when that song makes me feel can like totally independently mm-hmm. make me actually feel hopeful. Oh yeah. Even if I just heard it. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like I love when soundtracks can do that. Absolutely. It's very cool. And there are like a lot of different um, songs like we were even talking about, you know, Leaves from the Vine from yeah. before. Like any time I hear that song start to play, I hear anybody start singing that song. Sometimes I'll start thinking about like, you know, what it sounds like in my head and I'll like start tearing up because yeah. of like, you know, how great this soundtrack did at invoking your emotions. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very good. Yeah. yeah, the last thing I had, at least in the medium, just to touch on is the fact that this was aired by Nickelodeon yeah um and I think we and we've even touched a little bit on this but there seems to be almost like you I think the creators of the show Mm -hmm. would have pushed it further yes would have done some different things not not necessarily different but but more explicit and further things Mm -hmm. Than, than I think sometimes they were allowed to do mm-hmm. on Nickelodeon. And I know that the a little bit of the controversy about The Legend of Korra later on, mm-hmm. when they, the you know stuff starts to get canceled based on certain things they include, but we're only including light spoilers of The Legend of Korra, <laughs> so I won't say any of that, because I would consider that a major spoiler. <laughs> right. but, um, but so, like, I think almost... Not to say it held them back, but it it provided at least a little bit of a a constraint to to what they were to what they were doing. Even like like the example of they even make fun of themselves where they're like, What happened to Jet? It's like, well the, or Toph says, did he die? Or Suki says, like, did he die? And Sokka's like, Well, it was kind of ambiguous. Yeah. Like, well, it was not really clear. Yeah. And like that's probably because Nickelodeon said you can't you, you can't, can't kill him. Show like a death on screen <laughs> yeah. like that. Like yeah, yeah they're, they're like we're him. still like this is still technically supposed to be a child's cartoon, right? So like they're like we can't push it too far, and I think that even led to uh, the whole thing we were talking about with Ozai earlier. Mm. Like I think we may have seen more of the depravity that Ozai caused, if that medium wasn't in the way because i have yeah. a feeling that like they're trying to imply that he's done incredibly terrible right. things right but like we don't see any of that play out yeah. ever and so like th- i think a part of that was because it was being you know broadcast through nickelodeon like they they can't you know you know <laughs> put a cartoon with mass genocide just like on yeah. their thing and like expect most parents to be chill with it you know yeah. well think about even the time yeah because this like you'd say that and that would be true today if yeah. they were going to put it on in 2023 oh, yeah. but think about i mean this was uh mm. the mid 2000s late 2000s yeah i want to say it's I like probably should know 2010s it came or something like that, like 2010 yeah somewhere around there so it's it's much more true then yeah absolutely yeah, I, yeah. yeah so i do think in some ways there there was probably more that that they wanted to do mm-hmm. and explore that we didn't get yeah because of where it was yeah Exactly. Then again, if it wasn't on Nickelodeon, who knows if I would have ever seen it? Exactly. Would, you know, at the time. Exactly. So, good things about this. And that's the thing, yeah. Like you never know, because like you're like, well, you know, is it worth it if this thing like went further, but I never got to see it? You know, like yeah. if I never got to experience right. it, because I'm like, if outside of that, basically. I feel like outside of the medium of Nickelodeon, it would have just been an anime, right? right. Yeah. Like, it would have just been, like, because now it's kind of, like, wishy-washy. Like, some people are like, yeah, it's an anime. Some people are like, it's not really an anime, mm-hmm. you know? 
Um, but I feel like if it was outside of that Nickelodeon medium, everyone would consider it an anime, right? Like, if they did decide yeah, to push it further, you know? Yeah, well, it would have even just been more similar. Yeah. I mean, it would have been closer to It would have been closer to anime, are. yeah. Which is just a, a cartoon made for anything older than youth. Right. I, like, exactly. <laughs> like, that's what, I, like, that's what they're talking about, but... Yeah. And I think it's because in the West, not to go further down this rabbit hole, but like in the in the West, mm-hmm. our idea of cartoons is for kids. Yeah. And like you think about like what's the best animated picture, mm-hmm. Oscar winners all the time. Mm-hmm. It's always like the kids' movies and yeah. these some of these more serious films that are made with animation don't get looked at as much no. as like a contestant, right? Yeah. Um, just because it's how we view, mm-hmm. you know, cartoons in the West. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's like kids stuff. Versus in the East, it's the opposite. It's not yeah, true. It's it not. is for kids. There are cartoons. Like, some anime is for kids. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it is, like, the, the larger populations, you know, in the East, a lot of the times, so like, they partake in anime and and manga and stuff much more often than people do here so i mean in a lot of ways over the last few years like the the stigma has you know dissipated quite a bit surrounding uh, anime and manga right like you don't have to be like this weird weeb anymore basically (laughs) to like participate in it right um but like you know it's, it's just interesting to see how that's changed over time yeah. and like to see then people, you know, go back and forth because I think that's kind of a part of the reason why some people started to go back and forth about whether Avatar is an anime or not, right? Mm. Because it feels a lot like an anime. It yeah. feels a lot like these other shows that we watch. It's just very clear that it's for children, right? Right. It's very clear that we don't go as far as, like, you know, bloody or as deep as we go with other animes, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's interesting to kind of consider that stuff. And obviously all that goes into the making of of the stories that we love and stuff like that. Uh But yeah. Um, Before we move away from the medium, did you have anything else? No, I don't think so. All right, we'll go right in to the moral. Awesome. Um, in an effort to streamline <laughs> my life, <laughs> I've decided to try and focus in this section on what I think is the biggest moral. Okay. Um, not to ignore. If you want to talk mm-hmm. about anything else, that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, and we say, and I say that because it's not as if Avatar has one lesson. It mm-hmm. has many lessons, and some it we've does. already talked about. I mean, we spent some time talking about Zuko and how his his arc kind of deals with this, you know, pool between good and evil, yeah. and how we struggle with that in life. And it's a great depiction of that. And I think, you know, we talked about how Iroh is um, a great picture of unconditional love, yeah. and how we ought to maybe engage with those around us. Mm-hmm. But I think. I think when I went through it this time, the the one of the biggest philosophical things that I think they're saying is is to talk about this idea of destiny and your place in in the world, yeah. in the story of the world, and how it's important to understand that. Mm-hmm. Um, we you know we see the conversation Iro has about I don't know if I could beat Ozai. But even if I could, mm-hmm. that's not my place. Yeah. And this understanding of the goal is find your mission and execute that mission Yeah. to the best of your abilities. Uh, what do you think about this idea of destiny? Do, yeah. you, do you, first of all, do you agree that the story is saying it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then how do you feel about it? Do you think yeah. this is a good idea? Bet yet. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I definitely think that that is like a huge thing that the story is saying, to be honest, is that like um, this idea of destiny um, being something that like, because Avatar almost presents it in this way of like, you kind of choose your destiny 
but your destiny is always like in a specific path in a specific yeah. direction you know it was always meant to be this way in a way is what they're kind of saying um no matter what kind of choice that you make you know um yeah well and we see that with zuko yeah exactly exactly like we see that with zuko all the time and just like uh, there's so many different like moments of like destiny in the show you know like there's the moment where ang goes into uh like the spirit forest the spirit swamp that's there right yeah. um and like he sees toph and mm -hmm. before yeah. before he even meets her ever right like yep. he sees toph though like before this, it's like this idea of like the whole team avatar they were meant to be team avatar and yeah. i i love that idea in the show that they yeah. were all meant to be there they were all meant to be aids to the avatar on his journey even if like yeah. at whatever points they didn't know it especially with zuko you know mm -hmm. like it, very many points he did not believe that he would ever be you know teaching the air the the avatar firebending right like he never thought that that's where his journey would take him. Yeah. but you know that's where he ended up and like i i really like thinking about the concept of destiny and like that was almost inescapable for him like yeah. he um he got everything that he wanted supposedly right mm -hmm. Um, but he, like, he still wasn't happy. He still wasn't happy with any of it. And I think that that was kind of their point in saying, like, that's because this isn't where you're supposed to be. Right. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, this that is, wasn't his place. Yeah, that wasn't his place. His place was supposed to be with the Avatar, helping the Avatar. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was so conflicted about that that, you know, he it took him a while to get there. But I really like that idea in itself um and i also kind of like it in a way of like um if to me you know if destiny is like a real thing you know mm -hmm. in real sure. life just transitioning more into like a real life yeah, conversation no, about destiny That's, yeah um i i would think that it would be inescapable right you know like yeah. it would be like this is what is going to happen to you this is what you're going to do and you know there's no path that you can take to divert from that basically um and i like that kind of avatar presents it in this way of like yes that's true in some ways but there's also always choices you can make mm -hmm. you can run from your destiny your whole yeah. life basically is what avatar is saying and like never actually get to that point where you're achieving that never get to that point where you feel fully happy with where your life is going um like you can make choices mm -hmm. along the way that cause that to happen but no matter what like your destiny is still going to be this specific route or this specific thing you know yeah. so i don't know i it's an interesting concept to think about in real life yeah because a part of me like doesn't want it right if it's sure. real i'm like i don't want everything in my life to have already been laid out right yeah. like i want to be able to think that every day i'm making a new decision right but mm -hmm. then like there is also like a strange comfort in that like thinking mm -hmm. about like you know what if everything is already like set up in stone and i'm you know it's just gonna happen to me you know yeah. like so it's it's conflicting for my mind to think about that sometimes i think you know like yeah <laughs> i think actually you brought up something that's really good because there's a problem right here mm -hmm. when we bring this into the real world our avatar paints on the whole a very like the best picture mm-hmm of that of that concept of of destiny yeah. and these things being planned um and and everyone has a role and your your mission is to find your role and do it well mm -hmm. um it paints a very good picture of that yeah. uh, an appealing picture but the problem is when we bring it into real life we have to then wrestle with this problem of of free will mm -hmm. and you've touched on this where 
I have to somehow reconcile that I'm at least at minimum I really feel like I'm making choices right <laughs> and so if it is all you know step by step planned out why why is it that I really feel like I'm making choices mm -hmm. yeah and and so but even then I think Avatar does a little bit of nuance here mm -hmm. in showing us in Zuko and I think even I would argue Azula mm -hmm. um, what what it looks like if you if you choose to ignore your your place mm -hmm. um, if you choose to ignore that spot because you can mm -hmm. Zuko can go back to the Fire Nation he never had to leave mm -mm. it's not Ozai didn't even kick him out no he he left himself mm -hmm. because he knew that was his plan that was the place he had and this worked out immensely for him mm -hmm. because this was the right place when you look at Azula who is the second born so her her space should not be in the space of the fire lord she should not be the successor this is not how it goes similar to how Ozai mm -hmm. should not have been the successor to Absolutely. Azula and his father yeah but they choose to plow through that yeah even though this is not this is not what they ought to be doing mm -hmm. and this is devastating for Azula she ruins her her brain yes <laughs> she she has the break that we've talked about <laughs> and, and and so we see a little bit of people making choices seemingly that they don't correct mm -hmm. that they don't go back on mm -hmm. to defy what might be their spot their We'll, we'll quote quote unquote destiny we'll mm -hmm. call it you know um, and so it kind of interweaves a little bit of this idea of I I can make choices I can choose to ignore my place mm -hmm. and there's con there's going to be consequences for that yeah it's not gonna work out well but I can choose to do that and I think and obviously I mean you you know me you know a lot of what I think and and, mm -hmm. and believe, and I, I do think that that these that, that this concept of destiny, I would call a god, right. <laughs> is um, you know is laid out for us that God has sovereignly designed you know our, our lives in this way. Um, but I love to deal with the nuance of somehow it feels like I'm making choices though. Yeah, yeah. And then I would I would even take it a step further and being like. If, if everything is just destiny, right? Yeah, yeah. Why do I feel so much anxiety behind mm -hmm. a lot of these choices, right? I'm like, is that because it is destiny? Because I feel like every choice I make is either pushing me towards that or moving me away from it. Or, mm -hmm. you know, you know, if it's not that, like, I don't get if everything was like, you know, planned out in my mind, if I was like, I know exactly, you know, everything's going to happen in a specific way and that's all set out already. Yeah. I would be like, you know, why why do I have so much like back and forth about these dis these simple everyday yeah. decisions like where do I want to eat? Oh, my brain is empty. I don't know where I want to eat. Like it doesn't yeah. matter. It doesn't matter where I want to eat. Sure. Like <laughs> that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think if you, you know, go down that uh, philosophical trail, yeah. <laughs> um, you can, you know, I think the more you think about anxiety, mm -hmm. the more you think about, like, that kind of thing, the, the, and, and if this concept is true, right? Yeah. If this idea that you know it, it is set up there is there's a path there's a plan and our job is to find the plan mm -hmm. and work the plan mm -hmm. if that's if that's true then there there isn't a reason to, to, be to have anxiety yeah <laughs> and, and I think I think at least that that's accurate mm -hmm. that there isn't a reason to have anxiety that does not help my anxiety right. go away exactly. but it should <laughs> Yeah. But, it, but it absolutely should yeah. and I think 
you know, part of this is humans are not just the human nature, that rational. right? Yeah, I, you know, and we're gonna worry yeah. because even though, even though I, I sincerely believe that it is, I am protected. I am there's there's something, you know, sustaining me. I still, I don't always feel it. Yeah, and sometimes that feeling kind of takes over that logic aspect yeah. that maybe I've reasoned yeah. philosophically that yeah. I, I shouldn't be anxious. Right. But, yeah. And I, and that's all over this, too. Yeah. The only character, I think, in this story who is stalwart from start to finish mm-hmm. in, in his path is Iroh. Is Iroh, right. But and that's even because he admits he's already, he wasn't before. Yeah, and I was just about to say that's yeah. because he's already found his path, right? right? He understands his path now, whereas like everybody else in the show is unsure about their path, is unsure about yeah. even you know Ang, who's probably the most sure about the direction yeah. he needs to move in, is the most unsure about how he needs to do yeah. it. Like it just. I just love it so much. There's so much nuance and complication with the destiny idea in the show, right? Yeah. It's like, is it my destiny to actually kill the Fire Lord? Right. It, is that what I'm supposed to do or am I supposed to do something else? And that's yeah. the whole thing where when he's riding on the lion turtle, he's trying to convene with the other avatars and figure yeah. out what to do, you know? Yes, <laughs> and this is one of the things that I think is so, and this goes right into what we're saying mm-hmm. about how there is an element of, of choice mm. in this because every avatar tells him to kill Ozai. Yeah. The four he talks to all tell him to kill Ozai. Even the airbending avatar tells him to. That he's like, oh, I, I, she'll understand me. Mm-hmm. She'll understand where I'm coming from. Even she tells him. You have to put that monk training on a shelf because you're the avatar. You're more than a monk. Mm-hmm. Um, and do what needs to be done. So it seems like even past selves of Aang would yeah. have made this decision. But Aang is not ignoring his destiny. He's playing. He's filling his role. But he chooses to do it his way. He chooses to do mm-hmm. it in the way he thinks is right. Yeah. And, and I think in the end is a better solution yeah. to, to the problem. I think his Absolutely. his answer is, is better. And he's rewarded for this from the lion turtle mm-hmm. who teaches him, who gives him the, the who, way to do it. Who gives him, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like immediately rewarded by the lion turtle by like figuring out, he's basically like sitting on his back trying to figure out this puzzle essentially, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I think there is some element, obviously, of, like, the lion turtle calling him towards himself in sure. some kind of way, obviously. Yeah. Maybe kind of sensing some kind of conflict within the Avatar or whatever. And then, you know, trying to come to his aid or something like that. Yeah. Um, but it's just, like, it's so it's so fascinating, this idea of, like, him realizing that I need to, you know, track my own path, no matter what anyone is saying to me, you know, I need yeah. to, even if people think I should kill this man, that doesn't feel right to me. So I'm right. going to do what feels right to me. Yeah. Um, and then him being rewarded for that, him being rewarded for like, mm-hmm. you did what feels right. And that's exactly what you're supposed to do. So I'm going to give you the exact solution yep. to your problem. Like, yeah. And that's just like such a great concept, such a great idea, you know? Like Yeah. He's rewarded not just for following his destiny, mm-hmm. but for staying true to what he thinks is right. Yeah. And that's really cool. Absolutely. That's very cool. <laughs> Did you have another philosophical rabbit trail you would like to follow? I don't want to no. totally take you off if you had a different thought or that's just the main thing I was grabbing and I thought was interesting to talk about. But. Yeah, no, that was the, the main thing I was kind of thinking about too, you know? Yeah. So I'm I'm totally cool with that. We just leave it at Destiny because that's a huge one for their show. Yeah, so. oh, for sure. <laughs> for, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, yeah. thank you. Thank yeah. you for oh, coming no on. Thank you for doing this. 
um, in several parts with uh, crying babies sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for picking Avatar. You took yeah. one off my list so I don't have to do it. Hey, no problem. Um, <laughs> love that. Uh, so, um, and thanks for, thanks for being here. Oh. Uh, love to have this conversation and, and talk about stories yeah. all the time. So, yeah, it's thank been you. great. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and so so next month, I'm going to have my, my friend Daniel on the show, and we're going to be diving into the Lord of the Rings trilogy of movies. Um, so that's exciting. Um, he's been into that for years, so I'm excited to, to do that with him. Um, if you have any questions that you want me and Daniel to cover, I, w- I would love to get those. Email those questions to lifeslegendspod at gmail.com, all lowercase, no punctuation, just lifeslegends at gmail.com. We'd love to, to talk about any questions you want us to answer about Lord of the Rings. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to Life's Legends. Please like, subscribe, and comment. And until next time, savor your stories.